So it closely to me has uh, had a tradition of uh, after the awarding of each Nobel Prize in physics to arrange a special colloquium with someone close to that work that uh, achieved the prize. And um, I'd like to thank Professor Koromoto for arranging to have Joe and Candela here. Um, I'm giving the introduction though be just because I've uh, known Joe a long time and uh, I, can, I can do it without paper because I <laughs> was there for a lot of it. But uh, Joe did his PhD at, at the University of Chicago with Henry Frisch. Um, on monopole detections using squid, so kind of a low temperature guy to start out with. Then he went to CERN, and that's where we met. We, met, uh, we were uh, uh, fellows there working on the um, UA2 experiment on studies of the W and Z bosons when they were fairly new to the world of, uh, of known particles. And uh, then he went to Fermilab as a Wilson fellow, worked on the CDF experiment. There he started his uh, work in silicon detectors, which were the the very precise tracking detectors that sit at the heart of these large particle physics experiments. He did that in CDF and also worked on the top work, which was discovered there. And uh, so he continued to work on, on, on CDF and went to the uh, UC Santa Barbara and, uh, and got involved in the compact muon solenoid experiment at CERN, one of the two general purpose experiments, and um, worked again on silicon detectors, which are a huge amount of silicon in in, in, uh, in CMS, and then he was uh, a physics coordinator. He was a deputy <coughs> spokesperson and finally spokesperson. So CMS has a single spokesperson who was the person basically in charge of the thousand, the two thousand, three thousand uh, person team uh, that that runs these big experiments. So uh, he's uh, let's see, a, a fellow of the American Physics Physical Society of the uh, American Association for Advancement of Science and a recent recipient of the Milner Prize in Fundamental Physics this year. And uh, so you can see this, this picture that was used in the poster. Lest you think that for all his scientific accomplishments, he's one-dimensional, I wanted to put in another picture <laughs> <laughs> from a few years back in one of our many adventures with uh, rock climbing. I think this was in Devil's Lake, Wisconsin, but also is uh, has a lot of, of uh, ac activities that he's interested in outside of physics, and uh, and uh, it's sometimes he's going to tell you the story of how he got into physics, which had its path for it via via art, from starting from the Art Institute of Chicago. But with, with that, I would like to introduce Joe right. Candela. Thank you. I have all kinds of a, can you hear me now? Okay. I'm all wired up. I feel like I'm, thanks Darian for that uh, intro. I'll get even one of these days. <laughs> no. <laughs> we did a lot, a lot of great things together. I can't do most of those things anymore. My knees are shot, but um, that's not what you want to see, but it's an interesting. <laughs> Let's talk about this. Ah, uh -huh. voila, okay, see if everything works. I have a million slides, so I'm gonna have to talk a lot and go fast, and some of it, I guarantee you won't understand because I don't understand it either. <laughs> but most of it, I hope you'll get something out of it, okay? So this is a picture of the CMS detector. Uh, we're, we're right now in, in uh, op it's open, and there are repairs going on, so this is a picture taken in, in spring. Um, but it's just a, a nice picture to start with. So. I have to turn this on. Wow. Yes. So very quickly, I, I'm not sure what your background is. Are you, are you all physicists or not? No. I see lots of notes. Good. Uh, not for that reason, but... Uh. <laughs> so I just want to give you a, a very simple overview of what we do, why we do it, and then I'll go through. And, and some, some parts you'll get lost if you're not a particle physicist. I'll tell you when you have the right to be lost and forget about it and so forth. But small particles really answer big questions. There are actually very, very few uh, elementary particles and even fewer fundamental interactions among them. This is an important thing to know. And most of these particles don't even exist, not in the usual sense, okay? But they played a really big role in the formation and evolution of the universe and they actually play a, a big role now, even though we don't see them uh, in the normal sense. So we need to find them and study them. And if we can do that, 
we can learn a lot about the universe in general. And there aren't that many. So to do that, we have to go to very high energies and very small distances. So I wanted to go through real quickly some of the, some of the things we do. So if we, we can look, we've, we've sort of, in particle physics, gone to ever deeper levels and higher energies. The unit of energy we use is the electron volt. So I'm going to show you what that means, because I use that a lot throughout the, the, the talk. First of all, in terms of distances, an atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. The nucleus is about 10 to the minus 14. And the protons and neutrons and quarks are somewhere between 10 to the minus 15 and 10 to the minus 18 meters. So we had to probe really down to incomprehensibly small uh, sizes to find these things. And in terms of energy, the motion of an air atom is about 0.04 EV. Uh, chemical reactions are one to a few EV. Uh, nuclear reactions are millions of EV. And then remember, e equals mc squared, so mass can be equivalent to energy. And in fact, the mass of a proton is about a billion electron volts. So now I tell you where we are. We're probing distances down to 10 to the minus 20 meters, so much below this, 100 times smaller. And the protons in our beams that we collide are at 4 trillion electron volts, so 1,000 times the rest mass of a proton. This is the highest energy is ever achieved. And that's how we're able to do things. And in fact, this energy corresponds to the temperature of the universe one trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. So it was pretty hot back then. Now, we use something we call the standard model. This describes everything we see. Uh, it's been developed over the last 100 years, and, and part of this lecture is, is, is dedicated to the guys who were contributing. Um, ones who won the Nobel Prize this year, actually, contributed a key part to the, to the standard model that took a long time to verify. So they're quite old now. But I'll give you a quick history. So many, uh, over the 100 years, we had many advances in theoretical physics and the discovery of many subatomic particles that kind of gave us this model, the ability to build this model. It's something of a new periodic table of fundamental elements. This is what it looks like. There are just a handful of particles, really. And I'll tell you more about them in a second. It's really one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century uh, science. And, and in fact, the whole model is described by one simple equation. <laughs> uh, but um, the important thing, you might have, you know, we talk about the Higgs boson. So I want you to know what a boson is as opposed to a fermion. There are two basic types of particles, fermions and bosons. Fermions have, well, these, all these particles have some form of angular momentum. We call it spin. We don't really know what it is, but it behaves mathematically like spin. And fermions have a half, always ha half integer units of spin. So spin a half, spin three halves, et cetera. Bosons are always integers, zero, one, two. And this turns out to be extremely important. In fact, um, fermions, because of their spin half nature, they, you can't put fermions into the same state. And that's how you build atoms. You know, in atoms you have electrons, you add electrons, they fill different shells. It's because they're fermions that they do that. Bosons are the opposite. They like to lose their identity, all jump into the same state and kind of disappear. And that's exactly the kind of behavior you want for a force field. It has to have some coherent uh, you know, action. And in fact, all of the particles that make up structure are fermions, and all of the force fields are made up of bosons. OK. Bosons are named after this fellow named Bose. Is Tulika here? No, Tulika's not here. We have a friend named Bose. Uh, who, had this, who, who realized this effect, that these kind of particles jump into the same state, they clump together. And as I said, all fields, uh, well, I didn't say this, but all fields have energy quanta associated with them, and all field quanta for all the forces are bosons. So that's, that's important. They're the force carriers. Fermions, named after Enrico Fermi. There's an error in this equation, right? Shouldn't it be E squared over H bar C? I think so. Anyway. <laughs> I assume it was the photographer that did that. I can't believe that Enrico might have made that mistake, right? I never noticed that. Did you ever notice that? Shouldn't it be E squared over H bar C? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. Um, so fermions were named after Enrico Fermi. And um, as I said, electrons can't be in the same state. They have half integer spin. Atoms are made up of these guys. So looking at the standard model again, now showing the, the, the particles on a mass plot. And this is a logarithmic scale, right? So what you find, in fact, is that the top quark, which is the heaviest, is 344,000 times the electron. We don't know why this is. We don't understand where the masses came from yet. 
We know where the mass comes from, but we don't know why the masses are what they are. These are all the particles we see, really. Up and down quarks make protons and neutrons. If you add an electron, you get atoms, and that's what we're mostly made of. There's one p missing piece, uh, or there was one missing piece, which is the Higgs. Now, why do we need the Higgs? I'm going to give you a kind of a simple understanding of why we need the Higgs, and then I'm going to go through the history, which is completely incomprehensible. But, but, it, but there's a point to going through it, so I, I, I hope you'll enjoy it anyway. So most force carriers uh, turn out to be massless, but the W and Z particles, which carry the weak nuclear force, are heavy. Okay? This was a problem, in fact. Um, we knew this had to be the case because the force is short range. And without going into great detail, the, the mass actually sets a range for the force. Electromagnetism is infinite range, in principle, because the photon carries that force. And the photon has no mass. Um, you could put the masses into the theory by hand for the W and Z, but it turns out then the theory breaks down. It just doesn't work at high energy. In fact, what happens as you go to higher energy, you can predict that processes occur with greater than 100% probability. That doesn't make sense, right? In fact, that, that's not possible. So we know that this is not right. And to some extent, what Braut, Engler, and Higgs did uh, for winning the Nobel Prize this year was solve that particular problem. So they came up with this idea, uh, which we call the Brout-Engler-Higgs mechanism. Brout died, unfortunately, just a couple years ago. Otherwise, he would have shared the Nobel Prize, I'm sure. Um, and what, what, what they propose is that there's a field filling the universe. Okay? So this actually turns out to stabilize the, all the theories at high energy. If the field is made up of bosons, again, remember, bosons always make up fields. But it has to be a boson with no spin at all. And we've never seen that. We've never seen a particle, a fundamental particle, without spin. So it's kind of a radical proposal. Turns out that this field interacts with the Ws and the Zs. These are the particles, again, that carry the weak nuclear force. Technically, what it does is it gives them a longitudinal polarization. But by definition, that means there are particles that can't move at the speed of light, and particles that can't move at the speed of light have mass. So in the end, it gives them mass. OK, so the underlying theory it turns out, can be the kind of theory they wanted. Technically, it's called the gauge theory. Gauge theories are very attractive because they tell you exactly how the particles, in, the, the structure particles, interact with the field particles very naturally. So this was a very attractive kind of theory. Um, but some aspect of the theory has to be hidden because these gauge theories require the force carriers to be massless. And they get around this, essentially, technically by putting a field everywhere. Technically, we, what we, we say is you, you have a non-zero vacuum expectation value. You don't have to know that. It really just means you put a field everywhere that has a value everywhere in the, in the universe. OK. So basically, what's happening is you have this field penetrating the whole universe, and it kind of gloms onto some particles and slows them down effectively shields their fields, makes them move at less the speed of light, and they, and they acquire mass in the process. And the more the, the, the particle connects, the more it couples to this field, the heavier it is. All right, let me just get a sip of water. This is a short but probably incomprehensible tangent that I'm going to take. That tells you a bit of the history, because the history of this Nobel Prize actually goes back to the roots of particle physics. There are really two reasons I wanted to show you this, because uh, and you don't, don't feel like you have to understand it. I'll try to ad lib. Don't read the text if you, because it's too technical. But um, I'll ad lib and try to give you a flavor of what these people were doing trying to solve these problems. What's fascinating is how many Nobel Prizes were involved in getting to this point. I was rather shocked myself. So it started with uh, the realization that matter is quantized. Paul Dirac, who got the Nobel Prize in 1933, realized there had to be fundamental constituents. The key was to find out what, who, what they are, how they interact, and he came up with an equation that he thought solved it all. But it turned out it didn't solve it all because it, wasn't relative, it was not taking into account the fact that when you take quantum mechanics over to fields, into quantum field theory, in such a theory that has to be relativistically invariant, in other words, satisfying the rules of relativity, you can have part particles being created and annihilated. And that wasn't being taken account by him. So a many particle theory was needed. 
And that was developed, it's called quantum electrodynamics. It was developed by Feynman, Schwinger, uh, Tomanaga, and they got the Nobel in 1965 for that. And the force carrier, because this is electromagnetism, was massless, but it was a gauge theory, as I mentioned before, the kind of theory we wanted. But things got complicated when they discovered the nuclear forces. James Chadwick, Nobel 35, discovered the neutron and it was soon realized that there were two nuclear forces, one weak that takes into account radioactivity, one strong that binds the protons and neutrons together. Both were short range. Both were only about over the distances the size of the nucleus. So something was different about them. So Yukawa got the Nobel Prize in 1949 working on this. He proposed that the forces must be carried by a massive particle. That would make them short range. And the pion was proposed to be the particle that did that, and it was discovered in 1947, and somebody got a Nobel Prize for that. There were attempts to turn this into a quantum field theory, and they failed. So these guys, Yang and Mills, who got a Nobel Prize in 1957, came up with the idea of more complicated gauge theories than we had looked at, ones with more symmetries, very complicated algebras involved, and they're called non-abelian. Wolfgang Pauli, who got the Nobel in 45, pointed out that these theories require the force carriers to have no mass. So this is the theme. The problem was all the theories kept saying, yeah, this looks great, but we're not going to let you have this particle have mass. That was the problem that had to be solved. Big accelerators came online at CERN and Brookhaven, and there were hundreds of particles discovered. And we had to figure out what what would make sense of them all, and Murray Gelman and George Zweig came up with the idea of quarks. You've heard of quarks. So Murray Gelman got the Nobel Prize in 1969 for that. The weak force, the weak nuclear force, uh, this is just an aside. Uh, T.D. Lee got a Nobel Prize for showing that it had a, a very interesting violation of a parity uh, symmetry. And then in 1961, Sheldon Glashow, who's from Boston, who's uh, jointly, I think, uh, BU and Harvard, right? No, just, just BU now? Yeah. For 30 years. For 30 years, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. So Sheldon Glasher had an idea, which was to, to make a, a gauge theory with a, with a combination of two different symmetry groups. Don't worry about this. It's just complicated algebra involved in the, in the, in the mathematics. And he unified the weak and electromagnetic forces, but again, the force carriers were massless. So he put the masses in by hand, and then they discovered everything breaks down, like I told you before. All right. Yuchiro Nambu, who was actually on my thesis committee, he got the Nobel Prize in 2008, he started working with other fields. And he, he worked, he developed something based on work by Philip Anderson, extending ideas from superconductivity, and he showed that you can actually break the symmetry associated with a gauge theory. They're very symmetric, these theories. If you break the theory, you can produce a massive particle. And um, in fact, this is what happens in superconductivity. If you have a photon inside of a superconductor, its fields are essentially trapped. And it, if you write down the equations, it has mass. But the photon normally doesn't have mass. So the next thing that came in was uh, the idea of introducing um, a, a, a spin zero field if you like, this is by Goldstone. Anderson basically showed that it could work, but he didn't show how to do it with relativistic uh, field theory in, in mind. A chemist got involved and claimed it couldn't work, it could only work in the non-relativistic case, and that's where things stood at the summer of 1964. And then Engler and Braut um, in 1964 basically took the spin zero particle that was massless and, and, and had it interact with a vector particle, a spin one particle, they broke the symmetry of the, of the theory, and sure enough, they found that this massless particle that was causing everyone problem gets absorbed into this other vector particle. Peter Higgs basically did something very similar by using gauge transformations. Okay, so I probably lost you all. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> But I wanted to show you that what was happening was that there were many people working on this problem. It's an extremely technical problem, okay? It's, it's even hard for me to follow this. And what Braut and Engler and Higgs did, since this is the Nobel lecture, I wanted to, to make sure to cover this, is they solved this problem of giving mass, how you give mass to the force carriers without introducing other massless particles that can't be found. And then Steven Weinberg pulled this all together, basically, 
and used it in creating the standard model, giving mass to all the particles, essentially. And this seems to be um, very true and very workable. Okay, so that's the uh, technical part of the talk. So I'll hopefully, if, hopefully, if I've lost you, uh, you'll come back now and uh, we'll continue. But it's kind of interesting and, it, and it's important to note that what Brown, Engler, and Higgs did was they solved an extremely technical problem in quantum field theory. It's very hard to translate it to a public, a general public. But the most, the most simple way to put it is that people were trying to figure out how do you make short range forces, meaning forces carried by massive particles that we can write down formulas for that we can do calculations with. And these guys found the key. And that was what, what they've done. However, we didn't know for many years whether this was correct or not. We had to find this, this particle that was involved, the scalar particle, a particle with no spin. And that's, and that's what we had to do. Okay, now fundamental particles, it turns out, are very connected. And this is kind of uh, in incredible. The mass of the W, for instance, which is one of these heavy particles um, that carries the weak force, depends a lot on the mass of the top quark. And that's because it can transform, as you see here, just in its normal state, it can transform into a top and bottom quark and then back again. It can also radiate a Higgs particle and reabsorb it. So it actually depends, the mass of the W also depends on the Higgs. And the upshot of this, this is kind of an oddity of, or one of the kind of mystifying things about quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, is that the identity of a particle can't be completely separated from what it can become, what it can decay into. So the upshot of this is that if you're able to measure the top quark and W masses very precisely, you can predict the mass of the Higgs in the standard model of particle physics. And so in the summer of 2011, we did that. These were the values we had for the top mass and the W mass, and together they predicted that the Higgs should be between 114 and 185 billion electron volts, which is about the same number of proton masses, roughly speaking. But we couldn't be sure about this until we looked. So one way to look at all of this is that uh, space-time somehow encodes all the information about particles that can exist. It encodes how they can interact with each other. There are virtual particles that populate fields in the universe that can interact with real particles, and that's what we were seeing in these other diagrams. And if we can concentrate a ton of energy in one small spot, then we can make real partic heavy particles that we haven't seen before and that have some impact on, on how the universe works. And this kind of gives us an understanding of the underlying code of the universe, and that's what we do in particle physics. So how do you get so much energy in one spot? Okay, so we use uh, a Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch to the experimental part of the talk and show you how we do um, the measurements that we've done to verify the existence of this particle. This is the LHC. It's, 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 it's a very enormous accelerator. This is Mont Blanc, and um, this is the valley around Geneva. This, this is Geneva over here. So you can see it's quite a big accelerator. There are a couple of other accelerators shown. And the basic idea, the way we, we run, is we use a, a, a sequence of accelerators. We inject protons, we accelerate them, and we hold them on the track. And you can think of the accelerators as kind of like a, a racetrack where you can control the banks, the banking of the road. So the particles start going around initially at kind of a low momentum, and then we give them a kick each time they go around, and then you adjust the magnets, it's kind of like raising the banks. And so they can go faster and faster and faster. And at a certain point, you can't go higher in magnetic field. And so if you want to go to higher energy, then you have to go to a bigger accelerator. So that's what we do. We jump from a small one to a bigger one to a bigger one finally into the LHC, and that's where we get them up to this four trillion electron volt energy. This is a picture of the inside of the LHC. It's, it's a very long tunnel. Um, it's a 27 kilometer ring, 16 miles around. The biggest challenge was building the magnets that hold the particles on track. These are superconducting magnets. There's 1,230 of them. They're 50 feet long. Um, and they carry high current and they run at incredibly low temperature. Let's see. And this is the largest cryogenic system on the planet. It's actually 100 tons, 120 tons of superfluid uh, liquid helium to keep all of this cold. 
The vacuum is better than on the moon, and, and the, and the uh, accelerator is actually colder than deep space. So it's the coldest place around. And it's like Swiss chocolate. <laughs> Figure that out. No. So the LHC magnets actually have a huge store of energy. It's enough energy, in fact, to melt 12 tons of copper. And it's the kinetic energy of an a Airbus A380, which is one of the biggest planes in existence, moving at 700 kilometers per hour. But how much energy is actually stored in the beams themselves? Well, it's equivalent to 90 kilograms of TNT or 15 kilograms of chocolate. <laughs> so you didn't know that chocolate had more calories than TNT, did you? No. <laughs> All right, let me switch to the experiments. So um, I'll start with um, a view of all four experiments. This is the ring again, and you can kind of get a sense of how big it is. This is the Geneva Airport. So it's a pretty big ring, and in fact, the French-Swiss border is somewhere around here. There are four uh, big experiments. These two are the ones I'll talk about today. This is the experiment that I lead now, CMS, and our direct competition is Atlas. And they try to, we, we, these are big, very big complex detectors that we call general purpose detectors. They do all kinds of different physics. And there are a couple of detectors that are specialized that I won't talk about. LHCB studies uh, particles with B quarks, and Ali studies uh, collisions of heavy ions, like lead ions, uh, to study, well, I won't go into detail, I don't have time. So I'll concentrate on these two. Now ATLAS, uh, this shows the, the magnetic field they wanted outside their detector to deflect the flight of muons. This is a sketch going back 20 years. Now to do that was not tr simple. They had to build these very large toroidal magnets, and then they had to install them. And to get a sense of how big they are, that's a person. So these enormous magnets uh, had to be installed. So this is a, an enormously big detector. It's much bigger than CMS. It's, uh, here I show a very quick um, montage of the assembly of these guys. And you can see, there it is. Atlas is, um, here's, the, here's a picture of the full detector. It's a, it's a schematic of it. It, has 50, it weighs 15 million pounds, has 2,000 miles of cables. It's 50 yards long and more than six stories tall. In fact, here's a couple people to give you a sense of how big it is. And the size and the mass are what are required to do two things. It, we, we collide these high energy protons. We, make, we use the energy to make new particles. These new particles coming out can be very energetic. And we want to be able to measure the momentum. So we try to deflect them in, ma in magnetic field. And from the curvature of the deflection, we can extract the, the momentum, just, just measuring that curvature. If they're high enough energy, they barely get deflected, even in strong magnetic fields. So we need a very long distance over which to try to make them bend. And that's what sets the size of this thing. The other thing we try to do is take particles and stop them. Once we've measured their, their trajectories, we put heavy materials in, in the way of them. To stop them, they shed lots of energy, lots of light, and from that we get a, a very precise measurement of their energy. So the size and weight of these detectors are determined by the need to do those things. They also can handle a huge amount of radiation. Uh, up to 10 to the 17th neutrons per square centimeters can be sustained by these these detectors, which it's a big number. I don't actually know what it means either, but it's just an enormous number, you can imagine. So worldwide collaboration. There are 38 countries, uh, almost 200 institutions, 3,000 scientific authors. There are 1,000 graduate students. And the US is actually the biggest part of the experiment with about 21% of the PhD physicists. OK, let me switch to CMS. CMS is a modular detector. It had to be built in pieces and lowered into the cavern because our cavern took a long time to dig. It's close to the mountains and it was very mushy soil. And it took a long time to do that. It actually is smaller. It's, it's, it's um, not seven, six or seven stories tall. It's about four stories tall. It's about 30 yards long instead of 50 yards. So it's quite a bit smaller than Atlas. But it's twice as heavy. And it's because we have this huge magnet in the middle that's much stronger. And to actually stabilize the field from that magnet, we have to put in tons of iron, which you see in the orange. So this thing is like a small apartment building, but it actually weighs twice as much as the Eiffel Tower. It's a lot, a lot of iron and heavy things. Here you see lowering these pieces that had to be lowered 30 stories. The whole accelerator and all of the experiments are about 30 stories underground, 25, 30 stories. So we had to lower them. 
and we had to hire a really big crane to do that. <laughs> this piece is 4.5 million pounds, and it was lowered on four, four straps. But it's the, this magnet is the largest, uh, most powerful superconducting solenoidal magnet ever built. Okay. We also did some recycling of old Russian military uh, brass casings from the Northern Fleet. Um, we turned them into, this is a cheerful guy here. <laughs> we turned them into uh, brass bars and then used them to make these heavy things that I was telling you about that stop certain types of particles. These stop hadronic particles, particles that have quarks in them. And we measure their energy. And this is the installation of the last piece of CMS. And to get a sense of how big it is, there's some people there. So it's a pretty big detector, but still quite a bit smaller than Atlas, actually. The C in CMS stands for compact. It's, it's little. We're compact. We're like the Japanese version of the uh, automobile industry. But, um, but it's because the magnetic field is so strong, we don't have to make it as large. The particles are deflected by the stronger magnetic field, and we can measure them over shorter distances. That's how that works. And here is the detector being ready. There's the beam pipe getting ready to be closed. We have 40 countries, 190 institutes, 2,200 authors, 1,400 with a PhD, 800 graduate students. The U.S. is, again, the biggest part of the collaboration with 450 PhD physicists, uh, 200 graduate students, including uh, Northeastern. All right, part two. How am I doing for time? I'm probably halfway through, yes. There's four parts, so. We, we order out for dinner? No. I'll have to pick up the speed. So how does it all work? Well, the beams, there are two beam tubes, essentially. So there are two beams, two separate accelerators running in opposite directions, and then the beams are made to cross in the center of the two detectors. But the beams aren't continuous. They're made up of little bunches. There's about 1,400 bunches in each of the two beams, and each bunch has about 150 million billion, 150 billion protons. And they're focused into a tiny, tiny, very narrow beam, okay, smaller than a human hair. But even so, protons are so small that when the beams pass through each other, only about 20 or 30 pairs of protons collide. And this is what you get. Uh, actually, we're not actually, in the end, colliding the protons. Protons are actually bags of quarks and gluons. Gluons are the little springs shown here. That's, those are the particles that hold the quarks together. And uh, I don't know if I should go into this in great detail, because I'm probably going to run out of time. But the point I was going to make is that when you collide protons, you're not really colliding the protons, per se. You're colliding what's inside them. And we don't know the energy or momentum of what's inside them. That each, each, each piece inside them, we call them partons, the pieces inside the protons, they actually carry just some fraction of the momentum of the proton. So when the two collide, OK, we know that there's nothing going sideways to the beam. So before they collide. So when, when after they collide, that all has to balance. So everything going uh, transverse to the beam line after the collision has to balance in all directions by conservation of momentum and energy. But what's happening here, we don't know which one is more energetic than the other. So the whole system can be shifted in one direction or the other. Everything can be sprayed that way or sprayed that way. So we have to work with uh, interesting variables to do that. We work with transverse variables, transverse momentum, for example, and I won't go into this in great detail, but we use kind of a relativistic set of coordinate systems to take into account this, this boost, this high energy boost in, in the forward direction that can occur. Now, let me show you quickly how we detect what we detect. This is a picture of CMS before we put on the end caps. And one thing you notice um, is that there's lots of cylinders, right? And the structure is a very cylindric uh, structure. And I have a little cartoon of it here, and I get rid of the detector. And basically, the way it works is we have a, a, a section in the middle of the, of the, of the uh, experiment that's super lightweight, has many, many little nested cylinders of very lightweight, super precise semiconductor wafers that we use to detect particles as they go through. Charged particles leave a little bit of signal. And we know exactly where they leave that signal to as little as a 10,000th of an inch. That's how precise we know. And so, we have about 14 layers of that. So a charged particle will go through, it gets bent in the magnetic field, it leaves a little bit of charge at each of these layers, and basically we then connect the dots, and we get the track, and that's how we track particles. Once we're done tracking them, we try to stop them. So we put tons of material in the way. We have a, 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 um, a layer of these beautiful lead tungstate crystals 
They're about a foot long, there's 76,000 of them. They cost us something like $150 million, all, all told. And, and they're very heavy and they can stop a really high energy photon or electron, just stop it in its tracks. And we can see it generates a lot of light and from the light we get a measure, very, very precise measurement of the energy. So that's shown here, electron, photon. And then we have the brass, I showed you the brass. We have a brass layer that stops particles with quarks and we measure their energy. And then the only thing that can get through all of that stuff, there's only two types of particles in the standard model that'll do that. One is a muon, which is like a heavy electron, and it, and it doesn't see all this nuclear material and it's too heavy to be stopped by the, uh, by the lead tungstate, so it just zips through. And the other is a neutrino, which we can't detect at all. So we, we infer the existence of a neutrino by seeing an imbalance in the transverse plane. All the energy in the, in the direction perpendicular to the beam line, if it doesn't add up and there's a hole, that's probably a neutrino, or it could be something new. It could be dark matter, for example. So here's an example of an event. You see debris from the protons cracking up, and then you see these long tracks. These are actually muons. They go really far out. So you can think of these giant detectors as ultra-fast digital cameras that can shoot 40 million pictures per second. That's how fast they can run. So they have a fast response of about 25 billionths of a second. We can reconstruct the trajectories of the particles to within a few micrometers. So it's, a few, it's like a 10,000th of an inch. Uh, with 76 million channels of these silicon detectors. And then uh, we have to take into account that we can't keep all 40 million pictures that we take per second. That's too much data. We can only keep about 500. So we select the 500 best and record those. And even doing that, we end up with tons of data. We ended up with 22 petabytes of data in 2011 at CERN and 30 petabytes in 2012. A petabyte is a million gigabytes. So this is a really a large amount of data. And for us to process it, we actually have to ship it all over the world. So we have a computing grid set up uh, with 250,000 processors uh, spread over 35 countries. And here you can see the connection between Europe and the US is quite strong. Okay, how well does it all perform? I'll go through this quickly. The accelerator, first of all, worked, started up in 2010. Its efficiency was quite low then, but it got up to about 35%, which is almost double the historical efficiency of accelerators. These are hard machines to run efficiently. The, excel uh, the detectors um, were extremely uh, good shape. This is uh, all the subsystems in CMS, for example, were working at 95 to 100 percent level, and the same was true for Atlas. And in fact, the data quality was extremely high, and all of our results are based on about 90 percent of all of the collisions. So we, we really were running very efficiently. And this shows you the luminosity. This is the intensity of the beams just going up and up and up. And then in 2011, they kind of stabilized at a really high value. And one of the problems we had, this shows how many interactions there are every time the bunches cross. As I told you, we we're typically around 20 or 30. And this created a lot of problems, actually. Let me skip this. This is what we saw. This is a real event where you see many, many proton pairs colliding. And you see all the particles coming out, right? Now, if we're lucky, one of these collisions is something that's interesting. Very unlikely any of the other ones are interesting at all. They're just producing tracks everywhere in our, our detector. So we had to figure out how to take those into account and not include them in the, in the studies. And that was quite a challenge. So, with no, none of, if you only have one or two collisions, okay, and you look in this transverse direction, so the, imagine the beam is going straight into the middle of that plot up there, and you have the collision, and particles come out sideways, okay? That's what a typical event might look like, just chosen at random. In 2011, that's what it looked like because there were so many collisions, and that's what it looked like in 2012. So you can see we had a huge amount of noise that we had to deal with in some sense. But it turns out that the, the detectors are so uh, powerful, this was not a problem, at least not up to this level. It took a lot of ingenuity from our students and postdocs to figure out how to do this, but it worked great. Um, I will skip this because this is kind of technical. I was just going to tell you that um, all of these other events, they kind of hurt our efficiency. And then this, I was going to show you how the students recovered and so forth, but I don't have time. I want to show you here, uh, this is a particle that's low momentum and you can see that it gets caught in the field and just loops around. And we can track that. And I had never thought about it before, but the last time I gave this talk, someone asked me how long it took to get from here to, to there. 
I've never done that calculation before. And I think it's about, um, well, the distance is about, probably that it, it covered here is about 20 meters, so it's about 50 billionths of a second. So we basically were able to monitor this thing over a few, you know, tens of billions of seconds and reconstruct what happens in real time, which is pretty impressive. This is, this I've never seen uh, being done before. Okay, I'll skip this too. But I wanted to show you then, we then uh, were in very good shape. We understood the detectors extremely well and we can start looking at known processes. A known process is, for example, Z or a photon decaying to a pair of muons. And the data, this is our data in the black dots, okay? And the blue curve is the prediction of uh, theory. And what you see is that over 10 orders of magnitude, we get fantastic, um, really fantastic matching. So um, it tells us that we really understand what we're doing. I should also say it means that the theorists have done incredibly good calculations as well. And here I showed the production of top quarks with additional, uh, I think it's W's actually, with additional quarks uh, in Atlas, and, and everything matches the expectations very well. So these are uh, measurements of various processes with W's, W's with jets, W's with photons, W's with W's, etc. They're more and more rare, that's why they're going down. The measurements are the little boxes or, or dots, and the bars are the theoretical predictions, and you see that it's very well matched. Both experiments were measuring known processes with very high precision very well. And, and the upshot of that is to say, uh, we had everything basically under control, and we're ready to hunt for the Higgs. And so the next part of the talk I want to tell you about is the, the search for the Higgs boson. Um, actually, here I was just going to show you these processes I just showed you here. Um, you can look on a chart of all the processes that happen at the LHC, and this is the total rate of, of things happening. So you can see this number is 10 to the eighth. These numbers all occur be between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the second. So these are already one in a million to one in a billion sort of processes that we're, we were studying here with very high precision. But the Higgs is one in a trillion. And that's, that was the difficulty of finding it. It's extremely rare. All right, the discovery. There are four different ways the Higgs, are, Higgs can be made with different uh, probability. The highest probability is through a, a, a loop of quarks like this. And there are other ways it can be made. I won't go into great detail, but I wanted to say that for us to increase our sensitivity to look for the Higgs, we look at, we look at final states that would correspond to all of these different ways of producing the Higgs. Similarly, it has many ways it can decay, especially in the region where we're looking, which is this gray band. So it can decay to a pair of taus, it can decay to a pair of Ws, which then can decay various ways, or a pair of Zs would decay various ways. It can decay to a pair of photons. And we look for all of these things because it's such a rare process. And we have to add them all up. The most sensitive ones are Higgs to, to two Zs to four electrons or muons, four leptons. And the next one is, um, that's off, it should be up higher. The two most important channels are the Higgs to two Zs and Higgs to two photons. And I'm going to show you those in a minute. So why are these important? It turns out when the Higgs decays to two photons, uh, even though there's a huge background of kind of random photon signals, our resolution on the energy is so good that we can reconstruct the mass of the Higgs so well that we would see a little peak somewhere, okay, a little bump. And so this is a si very old simulation of what we'd have at 130 uh, times the proton mass if the Higgs were 130 times the proton mass. Uh, to give you some idea, the LHC produces about one Higgs per hour and after all of our work to try to find them, we end up with about 500 per experiment in our full data set. And the backgrounds are about 20,000 events. So the signal the background is quite low. Okay, we're really looking for something, a needle in a haystack. And the critical issue is the mass resolution. Now there's also this other channel, Higgs to two Zs to four leptons. This turns out to have very little background and you also get a very nice peak from the mass. You reconstruct the mass all the time at the same place. You get very good resolution and you see a very nice peak. The problem is it's really rare, so it takes a long time to see this peak. But I'm going to show you more about these two channels. Uh, here's the lead tungsten state crystals that I was telling you about that we use in, in, in CMS, and we get very, very good resolution, so we get about 1% resolution on the mass of the Higgs with these. Atlas uses a different style. They use a liquid argon sampling calorimeter. It doesn't have quite as good resolution, but it's, it's definitely good enough. Um, okay, so on 4th of July, 
we had a bunch of events that looked something like this. Um, these events, there's a lot of debris. All those yellow tracks correspond to particles coming out of all of these proton-proton collisions. But then you see here these two big red bars corresponding to the energy of photons. There are dashed lines pointing to them because we saw no tracks. There's no particles tracked. So whatever it was was neutral, and it was stopped in the, in the, in the crystals, which meant it had to be a photon. And you see they're right back to back. And if you assume it comes from a single particle, you can reconstruct its mass, and it comes out to about 125 GeV for this event. So we do this for all the events we can find, and this is what we saw. We saw, uh, what, like I showed you before, a steeply falling kind of random background, but there's a little bump, very little bump. So what's in this bump? It's actually a few hundred extra events with two photons that reconstruct to a mass of 125 GeV. And it took how many collisions to find this? 10 to the 15th, actually. So we had 1,000 trillion beam beam collisions just to find these few hundred events. That's how, why we had, it took so long. One of the reasons it took so long to find the Higgs is that it's so hard to produce and find. Atlas, the other experiment, completely independently saw exactly the same thing at the same time. So that gives us some confidence that we're starting to see something. And we looked at the Zs, the pairs of Zs decaying to electrons and muons. Here's an example of one in Atlas. So you have a couple of electrons here and a couple of electrons here that reconstruct the Z particles. And this is what they saw for all their events. What you'd expect is what's shown in the red, and that most of the data matches it, but there's one place where they have an excess, and it's at 125, okay? And CMS, same thing. You see an excess of events at 125. Believe it or not, these coincident small bumps, which were so hard to find, uh, put together were just what we needed to claim discovery of a new particle. So on the 4th of July, 2012, we had an official announcement. It was done at CERN and, and uh, also uh, broadcast to a big conference in Melbourne simultaneously. Um, what was interesting about it that surprised me was how many people worldwide found out about this. Nobody usually pays attention to what we're doing. And suddenly a billion people had watched it. And there were 17,000 articles written in two days. And uh, here are some of the articles. Um, I pulled out some of the more interesting ones to show you. Uh, three ways the Higgs boson discovery will impact financial services. <laughs> How the Higgs boson could become annoying. But this one I liked. Say God particle. <laughs> we do not like to call it God particle, so. But the popular attention really surprised us, um, but it's good. All right, my last bit here. I might even be done on time. Um, there was a question, what did we find? We found something, we thought, we know it's a new particle. It seems to behave kind of like you'd expect for a Higgs, but is it really a Higgs? Is it like a Higgs or is it a Higgs? So we came out calling it initially Higgs-like. So is it Higgs-like or a Higgs we like? That was the question. <laughs> um, and so we had to look at a lot more data. Um, and, and, the, and I'll come back now to talk to a little bit about what the Higgs is and what it does and what Broughton Angler did and so forth. This is a very special boson, it has no spin, and it's involved in connecting all of these three, for, the forces that are carried by these three types of particles. And this is an almost uh, probably a little bit too advanced for some of you, but what these guys proposed essentially was that there was a field, as I said, some sort of a, a field that permeates the entire universe, okay? This field has a potential associated with it, like a gravitational field can have a potential associated with it. In fact, you can make a, a, an object like this in a gravitational field, right? If you put a ball here, you would know it would probably roll down, okay? So this could be a, a description of a gravitational potential, but it's actually the description of the potential of this Higgs field throughout the universe. And the strange thing that happened was the universe went through a transition where this bump rose up, and instead of having a ball stably sitting at the middle of a bottom of this uh, kind of a trough, it rolls down and it picked randomly a position on a circle out here, and that's called spontaneous symmetry breaking. Meaning, rather than sitting at a perfectly symmetric central position, it chose one direction, okay? Why that one direction? 
Okay, that choice of direction is not symmetric, and that's called uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. When you do that mathematically, you give masses to the bosons, like I said, and you predict masses for the quarks. And the main thing I wanted to say was that, as I said before, you predict that this particle, this field, will connect more often and more strongly to heavier particles than light particles. So there are two things we wanted to do to know if this was the Higgs particle. First of all, does it have no spin? We can actually determine that by looking at how the particle decays. And second of all, does it connect to particles in proportion to their masses. In other words, as you get heavier and heavier particles, you see more connection, more of them being produced, and so forth. All right, so let me skip this. So that's what we had to do. So I wanted to just point out we had lots more data. It didn't go away. The signal didn't go away. In fact, we got lots more of these Zs. They become much more clear. And with this additional factor of three in data, we studied these issues that I told you about. We found, for example, that the couplings to the different types of particles, this is showing the ratio of the couplings to what you'd expect. So a number one is what you want to see. And they're all kind of consistent with one in both experiments. Another way to look at it, though, is are the couplings, does this new particle, this new field, connect to the particles in proportion to the mass? And that, that would mean that the, the results should lie along this kind of a line. So it really looks like it does. That, that was very striking. And the other thing, which is kind of hard to describe, is whether or not you can say it's a spin zero particle versus spin two or spin one. And the way you look at that is to see how it decays. If you think about a particle with no, think about a particle with spin, think about the Earth. When the Earth's spinning, there's, a, there's an axis it has, right? So there's a line in space. So it has a direction associated with it, right? If it has no spin, there's no direction associated with it. So when it decays over many, many events, the decay product should be just kind of randomly distributed. Right? If it had a, a, a spin direction, you might expect that there are more that are deflected out into the equ equatorial plane, for example. And in fact, we look at that and we found, it's hard to see in this data, but we find that we can exclude spin 2, 99.9%. We can, we can exclude spin 0 with negative parity, which means uh, that the events would look flipped in a mirror. At 99.8%, we, we can exclude spin one. So we conclude that all indications are at spin zero. And it couples to particles in proportional to their mass. So we said, voila, everything looks like standard model. And so March of, of 2000, what year is this, 13? Uh, March of 2013, we came out with a little, little tiny press statement saying, we think it's a Higgs boson. And it just, you know, and once again, the news came out we saw various uh, headlines like this. It was actually a big week in March, the same day. Uh, do you remember there was white smoke coming out of the Sistine Chapel? <laughs> and then we saw this headline. <laughs> so I thought that was very efficient of them. <laughs> and in response, having finally shown F Really, as of March, if you read the, um, the Nobel Prize report, they, I have a link in the talk earlier, that section where I lost you all, you remember? Just before I went into that, there's a link to the actual report of the history of the physics. And in that report, they specifically said that it was the, 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 um, the information we presented in March that convinced them. And so they finally gave the Nobel Prize to Francois Angler and Peter Higgs for what they had done 50 years ago. Uh, it finally had been confirmed by our experiments. And um, we, we reacted calmly with dignity uh, <laughs> and uh, sobriety. <laughs> anyway, so what next? I'm going to run over a couple minutes, uh, but I want to tell you where we're going next. And there's one, one interesting thing about this, this boson. We measured the mass. Atlas looks in their two channels, photons and Zs, and they got two different values, but they averaged out to uh, 125.5. Ours lined up better, and they averaged out to 125.7. So we measured the exact same mass, basically. And it turned out this mass is, is an unexpected. It doesn't quite fit where anyone was looking. Some people thought it would be heavier. Some th people thought it would be lighter. No one quite thought it would be right there. And it has an implication. Uh, it turns out if you combine the information 
that information, the mass of the Higgs, with the mass that we've measured for the top quark, remember I told you how particles are interconnected. We can say something about the shape of the potential that the Higgs field is in. Remember, I showed you these wells and you have a bump and so forth. And it turns out, depending on the mass, the, 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 the potential well can be very shallow, okay, or it can be very deep. Now, if it's very deep, the universe is sitting solidly there in a deep well, and nothing much is going to happen. But in quantum mechanics, if you have a shallow well like this, a particle can actually, we say, quantum mechanically tunnel out of it. It can escape. If there's a sh you, you know this. There's somebody waiting. I'm glad. You've done a good job teaching your people. Well, it turns out, uh, if that's the case, if that were the case, then the universe would not necessarily be stable. The Higgs field could uh, vanish. And if it vanishes, uh, well, everything else vanishes, right? And it turns out that all indications are that we're somewhere between stable and unstable. So the universe is only going to last maybe 100 or 1,000 billion years. We're not sure. I gave a talk at Congress yesterday. I told them they've got a limited amount of time to balance the budget. <laughs> and they better get cracking. Anyway, I wouldn't worry about it yet. And these calculations could be wrong. And it's only true, I think, within the framework of the standard model. And we don't know that that's the truth. So there is, in fact, a big problem with this uh, particle. We've discovered a particle, but it has a big problem, and that is with its mass. We measure the mass. The mass is not huge. It's not small. But if we try to calculate the mass, we have to take into account these virtual corrections, these things that can transform into and back into, you know, as I said before, it can, has, has connection to all the standard model particles. When you try to calculate its mass, and what you find out that you get a value that's absolutely enormous, 10 to the 19th GeV, okay? So it's only off by a factor of 10 to the 17th. <laughs> and um, that's the best we can do. And, and that really creates a problem for us. It's either a theoretical or a philosophical problem, okay? And the reason I say that is, um, Either we have to find some way to cancel out this, the effects that we see that drive the mass up high, so we're missing something theoretically, or there's a possible way of balancing everything just perfectly so that the universe can sustain this and cancel out these effects on its own. But to do that, you have to take all the parameters that we know in the theory and set their values to 32 decimal places, something like this. I don't know if it's 32 or 19. It depends on whether you square things. But um, and we've never seen a system where you've had to do that before to that high precision. That's called the fine-tuning problem. I say it's a philosophical problem because people say that, that if that is true, then it could be that there is a multiverse. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. There could be a huge number of universes. And we just happen to be in the one where the parameters have that value, which allowed us to live and see these results, which is called the anthropic principle. We, li we happen to live in the universe that allows life to exist. I say the hell with that because uh, I'm an experimentalist. There's no way I can test that theory. <laughs> so that's just irrelevant. So we have to look for what's balancing. And there is some ideas for that. You could have another set of particles whose contributions just cancel, OK? And these are partner particles. They cancel the effects. Uh, if you do it right, if you have a partner particle for every one of the uh, standard model particles, you get a cancellation. What's left is small. And that's what we want to find. The question is, how do you get partners to all the standard model? Well, one way is with supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is, is, is a, a, a basic symmetry um, wherein for every standard model fermion, there exists a boson. So it's a, it's a symmetry between fermions and bosons. For every standard model boson, there's a partner fermion. So one way to think of it is it's like a mirror, but it's a mirror with some distortion. It looks at all the standard model particles and creates an image of them that changes their spin, so the fermions become bosons, and it makes them a bit heavier. And we, we say they're heavier because if they were light, we would have found them. This has some benefits. We find out that all of the coupling strengths unify at high energy when you include supersymmetry to the standard model. And it predicts that there should be a standard model like Higgs boson with a mass below 130. We found one at 126. And it provides some clue about the dark side of the universe. So this is my last bit, I think. There's this cosmological connection to dark matter. As you may know, we now know that there's a lot of unseen matter in the universe. And it was first detected by looking at the, the rate at which stars were moving in the galaxy. 
and they were moving too fast. You would predict that their, their velocities would go up as you move away from the center of the galaxy and then go down. And this is what was measured by, uh, for instance, example, Vera Rubin, who did a, a cataloging of thousands of galaxies. So it's as if all the stars are embedded in some sort of a pudding that's rotating with them and pulling them along. And this is what we call, what's called the dark matter. And we're now pretty sure it's there. So we have to go over to the dark side. And um, we now know, in fact, that there's about 5% of the universe is ordinary matter. 28% is dark matter. So we're in the, definitely in the minority. There's more of this dark matter than there is of us. And uh, supersymmetry actually predicts the existence of particles that could fill this role. Okay? In fact, it even predicts the right amount that we see. So that's kind of interesting. The remainder is dark energy. We're not sure what this is. Uh, it'll probably be taxed someday. <laughs> I don't know, the Department of Dark Energy? I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, many people thought it would appear early, and the problem is we haven't found it. Uh, I won't go through this. This is a bit too detailed. But we've only scanned a very small part of the space of this supersymmetry. It's a very complicated model, so we have a lot of work to do to go after it. Uh, or there could be all kinds of other theories. I won't go through them, but there are many other theories that are out there that could solve the same problems that the Higgs uh, introduces. Um, finally, I just want to say we have over 550 <coughs> publications from Atlas and CMS, and they're all breaking new ground. We have many searches for new physics, and we haven't found anything yet. Um, our Higgs papers already have almost 2,000 citations, which is impressive. We have this Higgs that turned out to be just where nobody was quite expecting it. But the important thing is we're going to come back in 2015 at 13 trillion electron volts. So the energy is going up 65%. And we hope we can answer some of these questions then. Because I know you're going to be sitting on the edge of your seat all that time waiting. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hopefully we'll find them. We'll find something new. So to summarize, a new boson has been found. It was 48 years, 49 now, since the idea was hatched. 20 years it took us to design and build these machines and detectors. Three years to acquire the data. A generation of work by thousands. And all they got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> Actually, no, it was a great, uh, a great leap forward for science and a breakthrough for uh, the breakthrough of the year in 2012. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. If I'm, I ran over a few minutes, but... Uh, so is there uh, time for questions? Yeah, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So anybody? I think there's a... Okay, I'm um, hoping you could help me um, understand one of your slides. You had an all-black slide with white, with white dots everywhere. Oh, the Higgs, the Higgs field. Yeah. With a particle in the middle mm -hmm. that looked like it was kind of acquiring yeah. Higgs bosons. Do yeah. you, do you I, feel that the particles acquired the Higgs as they kind of pass it by? The, the, the understanding... My limited understanding of these things is that, um, well, there are a couple ways to look at it. The field has a non-zero value everywhere. So this Higgs field is everywhere. I showed dots because I couldn't show a continuous thing. And it, it really obstructs some particles. The particles are constantly interacting with it. So you can imagine a particle, instead of moving like a photon at the speed of light with nothing, it doesn't see the Higgs field at all, a photon. Just zips through, doesn't see it at all. Other particles keep bumping into it. So I, I tried to show that as if they're kind of being, st it get, they get stuck. Because there are different ways you can interpret it. One is that it, the field is just, it, you're interacting with the field, which means it can't move at the speed of light. And if a particle can't move at the speed of light, by definition it has mass. Another way you can think of it is that the field, and this is the superconductivity example I gave you. you under, do you know much about superconductivity? This is Meissner effect. A superconductor has perfect uh, currents, so you can't get a field inside it, right? So what if you had a photon trapped inside of a hollow superconductor. The photon's field can't extend to infinity anymore. It's trapped. You've trapped its energy. You, you concentrate energy in a small space. That's essentially another way to make mass. And if you write down the equations, you find the photon has mass. It's actually in my backup slides. So that's kind of what I was, I was, I was interpolating between those two models. One is that you've, 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 kind of tr you've kind of shielded the particle's field by glomming it up with the Higgs field. Or you can imagine it just bumping into all of these dots and not being able to move at the speed of light, but it's equivalent. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Any other questions? Yes. Ah, yeah. Are you able to control, like you were talking about, how the, the, the beams like, like push the photons together and the protons together and create? Are you able to sort of try and control 
it, it's pretty random because um, first of all, in quantum mechanics, you can never predict exact. If there are many possible outcomes, you can't predict exactly what will happen in any case. You can only predict the probability. So we do all of this statistically. We look at many, many collisions, and we look at the outcome by looking at the sum of many, the statistics, if you like, of all these different possibilities. We collide the protons really with well-known energies. So within a percent, we know exactly the energy of the protons. We don't know how much the pieces inside are carrying, how, what fraction of that is when they collide. So we really have to just look in this transverse plane and try to find the signatures, these final state signatures, like two photons. And we do many, many events, and we find, we find a bump, right? It, but I showed you this bump with a, have had a very large background. I could not tell you which of those events were the Higgs events. You see my point? We know that they're in there because they created this bump. But we don't know which are the background and which are the signal one by one. We only detect this statistically. OK? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sort of? OK. Yeah? Um, so when you look at the Large Hadron Collider in comparison with the last century or centuries of physics research, I'd say on a cost scale, it's probably the most expensive experiment ever built, probably. Well. Maybe? Um, depends what, it, it's a pretty, let me put it this way, it, 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 we have a problem in, in my particular field because um, to do what we do, we need these big machines, okay? So we, we, we actually pool the resources of 60 countries, okay? And then we all share one machine, okay? But if you were to compare us to other fields of physics, for example, there are some where we spend less than them. But it's not as apparent because You'll have 100 different groups with very similar small setups doing similar uh, things. So we are vulnerable <laughs> to that kind of an argument because, of course, governments look at us and say, wow, this costs a fortune. But in, in terms, there are many ways you can put this where you can see it's not that expensive. And it's certainly a lot cheaper than the space station by a factor of 10, which has produced very little science, actually, I hate to say. Um, actually, one of the most productive things it's done was uh, launched an experiment that was built at CERN that's been just put up there. But um, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble with NASA. I think, <laughs> I think it's great to, to, to explore space. But what we do is, is, is kind of expensive to, in appearance. Now, the other thing you have to remember, it takes us a long time. So the, the cost of the LHC program is about six billion. Pick your units, euros, Swiss francs, dollars. Over 20 years. So it was about 300, 500 million dollars a year. Um, the, the researchers come from 60 countries, there are 10,000 physicists involved there that are teaching, I estimated, over the course of the lifetime of the LHC, they will teach between 3 and 30 million physics students. You compare that to any university, that's incredibly cheap. My university, University of California, Santa Barbara, has two and a half times the budget of CERN, okay? And there's only 2,000 faculty teaching 20,000 students a year. So in terms of academics, and many governments are trying to draw people into sciences, so this is actually a very useful way to do that. So there are many ways to look at it that doesn't look so expensive, and of course that's what we try to do, because we have to keep selling it to our funding agencies. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, while we're on, on funding, um, I was impressed by the amount of liquid helium that yeah. you had there, and recently there's been a kind of a liquid helium a problem, you know. In, in the U.S. In the U.S. Is, yeah. How does that play out in, in, in Europe? In, in your I, don't, I, I don't know. We, 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 we hold our liquid helium, yeah, um, yeah. but we can't actually store it all. So when we warm up the accelerator, we have to sell it back to the helium companies. And then we bring it back. Effect, no, but the I can tell you the amount of helium in the LHC is equivalent to the entire world production for one year. That's how much helium there is. Yeah, no, it's a massive. It's a massive amount of helium. And when we had the accident years ago, uh, there was a, a break in the system that released 6,000 uh, kilograms of liquid helium, which expanded a factor of 800 instantaneously, you know, blowing these 20-ton magnets off of their moorings and throwing them around like pretzels. It's pretty, uh, but we've uh, we fixed that problem now. We're, we're working on that. Uh, we're working on that now. Science could be dangerous. Uh, all right. I don't know if there are any other questions. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Speaking like there are lots of students there. Could you expand a little more on the role 
contributions that have made to this project? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting thing because this program goes back many years and, and the students, um, the students typically, we don't, in our field, we don't want to get, we, we like students to be involved in, in the design and construction and so forth, but we want them to do physics. So 20 years ago, um, there weren't many students involved in this program, and as we get closer to having data, more students get involved. And the students come and they have, they have the free time and the energy to actually understand how to, to do this, to, to run the software and analyze the data. So many of the results you saw, most of the results are from students and, and young postdocs, I would say. Uh, the, the, the faculty actually guide them, but you know, we don't know how to type anymore and you know, <laughs> we're all going senile, no, I'm kidding. But the young guys do a lot of the work. So these, the, the, um, the Higgs was, in the end, I, I, I often like to say it's like a relay race where people have been working on this thing for 20 years and the la very last lap was probably run, uh, done by people age, average age of 26 in the, in the discovery work, which was a great experience for them, I think. They, they really felt the historic sense of what they were doing and, and uh, I have, we have to keep warning them that this doesn't happen every year and that, you know, they shouldn't expect this for the rest of their life uh, to have these big discoveries, but it was a great experience for them and they, they really do play a big role. Yeah. See, that brings up the question of what's the next accelerator going to be like? Or oh, uh, we like to think big, actually. I see. Oh, let me get, this will take too long. I'm going through all these slides again. I have a bunch of slides from a talk I gave. Those are the 26 year olds you saw. Hold on. I was in Congress yesterday, so I had to explain to them that there's actually, we actually do some useful things as well. But um, I might have to go. I will show you. So, this is one of the things we're looking at. So the, is there? So the white ring is the LHC. And we're looking at a new possible ring at CERN. That goes uh, across, under the lake. It'll be the fastest way into Geneva for sure. And under, around the Celev Mountains and, and just along the base of the Jura Mountains. Um, but uh, some people thought that wasn't big enough, so they wanted to look at this. It's cheaper to make it bigger. It's cheaper to make it yeah. bigger. See? We need digging. The rock is better. Yeah. Is that right? Is that what happened? Okay. So the rock was better out there. And so we're looking at that, and, but it will take many, many years. This is scheduled. This would be something that would happen in 20 years from now or something like that. And the idea would be to put in much stronger magnets and we would go to 10 times the energy of the LHC and see what's there. Um, but it's not, you can imagine it's not cheap. Okay? Yeah? How long does, what, what's the duration from exciting the protons until they actually like collide? The protons? Yeah. Well, um, from, from when we, you mean the whole accelerator chain? Yeah getting them in, and, and then to ramp them up in energy. It, 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 it's about of order an hour or two. But once they get up to the highest energy, we just let them keep going and going and going, and they're constantly colliding. Along those lines, like how long do you want to spend So then the, we can hold a fill, as we call a fill of protons. Typically, it averages five hours. can go anywhere from 15 minutes to 20 hours. Depends if something breaks in the machine. And uh, they try to run every day, but as, as I showed, the, the actual running time is about 30% of the clock time, because it's a very complicated machine, and uh, <laughs> many little things go wrong all the time. Yeah? Um, would there need to be an intermediate there? Like, would, Good. Wow. Very impressive. Very impressive. <laughs> uh, the idea was going to be to put it in the same tunnel. You mean to, to, to be able to boost from one energy to the next. There was a thought of using the LHC itself, but um, the cost is too high. Uh, so they have an idea for putting a very simple accelerator in the tunnel there hung from the ceiling and then the main one on the floor. So you'd actually have one where you'd, an intermediate, simpler one. Yeah, good question. Wow, I'm impressed. Yeah. Uh, are there any new technologies that have been 
been developed for the experiment that could translate into improvements into our everyday life? I think so. Um, we've always, in the field, we've always been ahead in something. You know, we've always had to kind of do something that no one in industry was doing at some time or another, but it always changes. So once upon a time, we had faster electronics and faster telecommunications gear than telecommunications companies. Now we just buy it from them. Uh, there are a couple things we do that are kind of unusual and cutting edge. One is we, we had to develop electronics and, uh, and sensors that can be extremely precise and handle huge amounts of radiation. And some of those now are, are used for space, uh, where there's lots of cosmic rays, military applications, but also for imaging, for medical imaging. Our really high precision pixel detectors, for instance, um, they're being used in PET scans and things like this where you get much more information for one-tenth the dose. So uh, you can limit the damage to people. The magnets are very uh, important. We use, uh, we, we invented superconducting wire in our field to build these magnets to begin with. And, and there's some things like that. Um, there's, um, gosh, there's lots of different applications. Uh, but those are probably the, the most striking ones offhand. The worldwide, sorry? I think you could mention the worldwide. Yes. The worldwide web was invented at CERN, by the way, if you didn't know that. Because we, have so many, we had so many people from so many countries. The internet already existed. We had Al Gore visit last week, and we, <laughs> we clarified this with him. But the, the internet was already invented, and you could already send email. I was sending email in the 1970s, right? Remember back then? Yeah. And you can get files from other people on their computer anywhere in the world, but you had to know the exact path, you know? And then they had to set the protection for you, and the computer had to be on, and all that stuff. So at CERN, they realized this was causing really too much trouble for us to communicate with each other across 60 countries. And Tim Berners-Lee, when I was, I was a fellow at CERN at the time, he was down in the hallway. Uh, I don't think they had enough money to give him an office. He had his desk was in the hallway. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I think he had an office. but. Um, he came up with the idea of making a uniform record locator, URLs, and the whole concept of the World Wide Web. And that was born at, at CERN, which was a good thing because CERN then made, made it uh, um, free to the world. It would have otherwise, if it came from some corporation, we would have been paying a lot for it and so forth. So it, it wouldn't have traveled like it did. Um, I tried to explain this once to a, a budget, a staffer for, for the US budget, uh, and she's just, she, what? OMB. For OMB, yeah. And she just looked at me and she said, well, it would have been invented somewhere else. I said, okay. but, um, but it wouldn't have been free elsewhere, so that's a good thing. So thanks very much for, uh, oh, you have another question? Yeah. Um, with so much noise from the collider, how is all of that managed? So the question was, with all the noise, meaning all the other collisions, the debris yeah. from all the other collisions, how, how do we manage that? Well, uh, badly initially because um, we, ha we have to track the particles, and, and again, you just have dots, right? So now, what dots correspond to which particle? You have to try many different combinations, and so the, the software was taking a very long time. It was using a lot of computing power. So what we had to do was learn to develop better algorithms um, and, and better ideas, and most of it was done by young people uh, in the collaboration, who did it very quickly, in fact. And there were even more challenging problems. But they found ways to recover all of the losses and actually pr get better performance than we had before. Now, we're going to go to much more uh, of these multiple interactions, maybe as many as 200. And we don't know how to do that yet. So if you have any ideas, we really <laughs> We're going to figure it out. But uh, it's, it is tough. But the, the information is there. The problem is processing it all. And the bigger problem is are the neutral particles, because we don't see them. They just enter into the heavy parts of the detector, and we can't track them so easily. So we're working on ways to do that, but it's very tricky. But for the moment, we're okay.